Uh, so let's talk about for a moment about the Kristallnacht observance. Uh, you know, 82 years ago, uh, as an eight-year-old child, I saw my synagogue burn on November 9 and 10. And for the first time, I heard about Dachau and Buchenwald when 30,000 men were taken to these concentration camps. Thank God today, Austria is a democratic country, a uh, very important uh, support of Israel. And also, particularly, I want to say thank you uh, to uh, Chancellor Kurtz uh, for when, he, when you chaired the European Union. Uh, you were actually, I was there and spoke at a conference against anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. What is your assessment about the uh, anti-Semitic rise throughout Europe and what security are you providing to the small Jewish community in Austria? Yes, well, uh, quite, 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 um... Uh, a, a, a difficult time, and I just maybe also want to say that on a day like this, um, the Reichskristallnacht, something that of course we all uh, uh, commemorate also in Austria, uh, and we try to do this even in times of COVID, when as you know there is a lockdown in Vienna. Unfortunately, on the on the on the eve of the of the second of November, we had to go into lockdown again. So much of what we are able to do nowadays is virtual, and here also with you, of course. <laughs> I, I, it would have been much nicer to be physical and in person, uh, but of course that has some impact. But nevertheless, that very much is is part of of the of the remembrance, and and that will happen uh, virtually, of course, in, in 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 these cases. I think you 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 pointed at something which is a which is a worrying trend. We've seen uh, absolute uh, rise in uh, this uh, uh, hate crime. Uh, on anti-Semitic incidents that have happened uh, in Austria and also in other European countries. There was a quite an interesting study by the EU Fundamental Rights Agency in last year, uh, among the EU 27, also in the UK, uh, where they found rising levels of anti-Semitism in all of Europe. Uh, and uh, we know, of course, uh, we have also seen that in Austria, we've also done our own study uh, together uh, with uh, the uh, Forum Against Antisemitism and the Jewish Community Vienna uh, that we also just very recently, uh, uh, pub that was very recently published, uh, which says that uh, we've had also more uh, incidents, uh, unfortunately, in Austria, most of these on the internet. So there seems to be a real, these, the social media has, has opened, if you wish, a new box, uh, a new uh, um, as yet unregulated area and also a bit uncharted area where it is possible or where people feel that they, um, that they uh, can, can say things. Uh, uh, and it is a reflection, of course, possibly of what people feel. This is something that I, we believe needs a lot much more study and which needs a lot more, uh, more um, uh, in turn, uh, examination. What we've done on the EU level, perhaps, during our presidents, you mentioned it uh, very clearly, uh, the, uh, it was in December 2018, during our presidency, the European Council unanimously adopted this declaration on the fight against anti-Semitism. Some, some of the European members were not happy about the initiative. <laughs> that, that, that is true. But it's, it's been there and it is not only a declaration. And that for me, that was for us so important. And that's why we really worked so hard on, uh, about it. Because it was not only a declaration, because you know these words, uh, it's, it's easy to come up with a piece of paper and maybe a declaration. But what was started was a process, a European process with a working group that works on securing uh, the, the, the premises uh, of, of, of the Jewish communities, education on Holocaust, Jewish life, show our remembrance, data collection on incidents that happens and there's this working group that continuously works that and every member state, every member state undertook to adopt and to develop a national strategy on anti-Semitism uh, by the end of this year. And we ourselves are really very hard working. We're in the final stages of putting the strategy together. 
Um, and uh, I mean, uh, if you ask what is Austria doing to protect our Jewish community, you, 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 you've been there many times, you, you know also from the Austrian Jewish community that, I mean, the current government takes uh, its responsibilities here very, very seriously. And I think also in the Austrian government program, we have rarely seen such a very strong commitment to uh, the, the Jewish community and to protecting Jewish life. Uh, so it's it will probably be much easier for me to explain all the various elements of this once we have our national strategy it will be hopefully out very soon but it will see security justice education social cooperation on the various levels we will try to make sure that the community is protected and that the remembrance is fully assured uh, you serve with distinction as deputy permanent representative Coming back now to the UN, in what way uh, has the UN changed? Well, for me at the moment, I think the main change that I see uh, is of course COVID. It's something I have not re I have been at the UN a couple of times, but while my while I have it uh, in, in in my memory, uh, you know, you spend uh, uh, all day basically in various meetings and and in side meetings and in bilateral constant consultations at the uh, side of the room or in, a, in the Vienna Cafe at the UN. Uh, all of this is not uh, possible at the moment. So for me, the, the immediate biggest impact is just simply, it, it, this is not the UN as I remember it, as I know it. But uh, I can say from if, sort of, if you, if you take out that whole COVID related uh, uh, difference that we have, um, I think there has, there is now a, a maybe a, a stronger pushback on many of the values that uh, we may consider as Western values. Uh, China has become very strong in the United Nations. This is also due to some extent because the US has, has drawn back, has sort of withdrawn from some of the UN bodies um, and, uh, and therefore is not as, as physically present in the, in the meetings. Uh, and and as, as the EU, we, 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 we do note that the, that the opposition to some of the, the values that we have been working on and, and trying to implement and trying to, to also spread during the past 70 years, uh, 75 years at the UN, that that is becoming very difficult. And there are more contentious meetings now. There are more, more rights, to rights of reply. The, 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 the mood is a bit more combative. Um, we saw that already in some of the speeches that we heard during the, the high level week, uh, which were all on record uh, through recorded video messages. Um, uh, but in essence, I think what we have experienced, and this may be one of the difficulties that we face, is that uh, the, the UN is now 75 years old and the the, the organization now, of course, is still in its structures that were conceived 75 years years ago and the world out there is a lot is very different and many of the tools and instruments uh, might be in slight um, might be a bit jarring with reality simply and I think that of course sometimes can be dealt with if everyone wants it to work but if you have some members who are less interested in having the UN succeed uh, then the UN has a lot of trouble to succeed and, and that's I think where we are at the moment. I want to salute you on the latest uh, General Assembly vote, uh, Austria abstained when it came to uh, uh, a criticism of, uh, of Israel. Uh, is this a new direction of, uh, of Austrian policy? There has been a, a, a shift in Austrian policies to some extent. Uh, we, we have, uh, we generally, we always coordinate with our EU partners. And we try to find an EU line. This is sometimes not possible. And in those areas where there is there is no EU unity, we we have moved in the in in, in, in and we are also pursuing this new policy now uh, uh, with um, also with the conviction that it is the the right thing to do. But it is always I can tell you it is always a an, an issue where we where we have to uh, try to also see exactly how we we really end up helping Israel because a vote is something which is very easily cast. Uh, it's, it's not hard to cast a vote in any sort of direction. 
but you have to also see how it fits into the bigger picture. There are you know, several resolutions and there are very many sensitivities. Uh, and, and I think our Israeli friends know this. And I think they also acknowledge that Austria is really uh, one of the friends uh, that they can really rely on in trying to make sure that Israel is not uh, singled out and treated unfairly. We have, I think, uh, also, I, I met just recently or for lunch with uh, my Israeli uh, our colleague, uh, Gilad Erdan, who's a, who's a great guy, and uh, he, he also confirmed this. You would have to ask him, frankly. Uh, he would have to tell you. I, I don't want to speak for him, but I, I think he, he knows, and uh, I think uh, our friends know where we are on, this, on these issues. Yes, I, uh, Parky Synagogue welcomed uh, Ambassador Erdan, and uh, actually it was at the height of the pandemic, but he, uh, he came to services on uh, Rosh Hashanah the first day, and uh, I blessed him. And uh, it was, uh, again, you mentioned January 27th. Uh, I invite you now, our annual uh, Shabbat UN International Holocaust Remembrance Service with the Secretary General and uh, Guterres, Secretary General never missed any of the uh, Sabbath services before January 27, with members of the diplomatic corps uh, remembering the, the Holocaust. And uh, I posed the question to him at the time, uh, when the Holocaust survivors will no longer be here, including myself, uh, who will tell the story? And he responded in a very, very genuine way. We will tell the story, and you mentioned the Holocaust Outreach Program uh, by the UN. Uh, and then I think uh, Austria is uh, actually trying to provide citizenship uh, to uh, descendants of uh, Austrians who had to leave during the Nazi era. Can you elaborate on that one? Uh, gladly, even though I have to say that as, as the UN ambassador, I don't Will, I will not be able to answer any technical questions on this because it's actually quite a, a complicated legal issue as well. But it is, uh, nevertheless, I do know that, yes, we are very proud of this, uh, this amendment to the Austrian citizenship law, uh, which was uh, um, uh, just uh, passed in October last year and which entered into effect uh, 1st of September this year. It's the new paragraph 58C of the Austrian citizenship law. And it gives the possibility that victims of uh, the Nazi regime and their descendants can now acquire Austrian citizenship. There are a couple of conditions involved. Of course, there has to be some connection to Austria, which is, which is clear. Uh, but we, I, and, and I think all of the sort of the, the, the administration and uh, the, all that, uh, um, we, you, I would ask, please contact uh, Helmut Böck. He is our Consul General, you know him very well, of course, uh, our Consul General here in New York. So he, he knows all the details about this law. But what it enables is that it, uh, uh, the victims and their descendants can get very quickly uh, Austrian citizenship without losing their own citizenship. And we have already in these, it's been now possible for a little over a month, we already have uh, more than 10,000 applications worldwide. So it is something that uh, we are extremely happy that it is really being used. Uh, and we are looking forward to welcoming all these new Austrian citizens uh, as our sisters and brothers. I don't know whether you were in Vienna uh, two years ago when Chancellor Kurz invited former Holocaust survivors for the first time coming back to Vienna when I addressed the parliament, and it was a very, very moving scene. Were you in Vienna at the time? I, I was not, I was theoretically on post in Vienna, but I remember I was out of the country traveling, unfortunately, because otherwise I would have been there somewhere listening in the, in the distance. But I was, I was, I remember the event. Uh, it was, it was a big, uh, a big occasion. And I think it fits very strongly into all uh, our efforts to make sure that because you mentioned that Holocaust survivors, uh, we have relied very much on their personal uh, memories and, their, and, the, and the way that they addressed uh, their personal recollection of the times and that this has been one of the strongest 
um, and, and also most moving uh, testimony uh, uh, policies that, that, ha that have really been used also in schools, especially the young people. Uh, and, and we have this um, specific, um, our, our Ministry of Education has, a, has this Erinnern uh, AT. It's, it's, a, it's an internationally uh, and nationally active institution that focuses on telling the history of na Nazism and also of the Holocaust and preventing anti-Semitism. Uh, and so this, this institution uh, situated at the Austrian uh, Federal Ministry for Education uh, also has worked in the past with, with uh, the, the, the Holocaust uh, survivors uh, and is also ensuring that their testimony will also be there in the, in the future, especially for the case of education in schools. Uh, this is a very important program. In fact, in my address at the parliament, I mentioned the importance of educating children uh, to love and not to hate. My own experience, I became a pariah uh, after the Anschluss. My Christian friends severed all contact with me. We could not go to the soccer field together. We could not go to the park. Uh, students of the same class, we were segregated, separate schools, and uh, no sports events. And again, they did that on the instruction of their parents. So education, children are born with love, but they can be taught how to love, they can also be taught how to hate. So I think that program is a very significant one. And I'm wondering when I came back to Vienna after the Holocaust, surviving uh, in uh, Budapest, thanks to Karl Lutz, a Swiss Consul General, a diplomat, a hero diplomat who saved lives, like uh, the Denuncio, uh, Wallenberg, the Swedish, and uh, also Spanish and Portuguese. When I enrolled uh, the uh, again in the gymnasium, am Stumbastai, uh, I must tell you, I was the only, only Jewish student among 800 in 1945, and uh, I'm sorry, 1946. Uh, Holocaust discussion was not mentioned at all, none, for both. Uh, did you go to Rural Gymnasium Mainz too, or you went to another school? I went to another school. I went to the uh, Bundesgymnasium 13 uh, in the 13th district, Fichtnergasse, yes. When, when, when did you first learn about uh, the uh, Holocaust in, in, in the school? Yeah, I, I, was, I was lucky uh, enough that um, when, when I went to school, the, 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 uh, the teachers were encouraged to teach uh, uh, the, the time after 1930 in the, in the final, which in, in Austrian system is the eighth grade. I think it would be 12th grade, the, 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 the last class in high school. Uh, and um, but it did not tell you exactly w which years to focus on. So you had the possibility to teach about the 30s and until 45. You could theoretically also focus on the history of Austria after 55, and thereby completely uh, avoid uh, avoid mentioning that time. I had a teacher who went into great detail, and I also participated in a Freifach in a in a, in a non man in a, what is it called a uh, a, a subject I could choose, which was called politi politische Bildung, which which went into great details about uh, the times of the twenties and the thirties. But we did we did go into that. But m many of my, my 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 friends who went to other schools actually did not learn about it. All that has changed now. I mean that that has really changed. The curriculum now makes absolutely sure that uh, younger students uh, under fourteen um, and then also the older students. Uh, all learn about uh, this time and about the Holocaust. And there also, uh, this Arinan AT, of course, supports also teachers, um, training the teachers, excursions to concentrations, camps, discussions with survivors, cooperation also with Yad Vashem, for example, but also other international institutions, 
uh, uh, UNESCO, various institutions to, 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 to really make sure that this is something that is absolutely part of every school curriculum in Austria. You know, um, Holocaust denial, regrettably, very, very painful and uh, still exists and spread, uh, including by some countries uh, like Iran, Ahmadinejad, in the UN, Holocaust denial, the former prime minister of Myanmar and so forth. Uh, how serious a challenge is that to be overcome? Well, it's uh, it's an extremely serious uh, incident, uh, uh, challenge, and and it's something that we are, of course, also worried because as time moves on, uh, and and uh, the, and if these and if there is a proliferation of denial, um, uh, we see now that people in this new world of of internet and of social media, uh, everyone has an individual reality that they live in. That they build together from their news feeds. Uh, my children, I have three children, everyone has their own news sources, everyone has a separate music list and a film that they want to watch. It's becoming very difficult to watch a family movie on the weekend because everyone, everyone has their own choice and making compromises become very difficult. So in this world and in this world where everyone lives in your own little reality, uh, if you, uh, you know, buy into to some uh, news feeds that have anti-Semitic content, content or, or deny the Holocaust content that the, the lie, denies Holocaust, uh, you, you, you will be very strongly influenced and you will never hear uh, 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 the, the, an opposing view. In the UN itself, it is always possible to counter uh, 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 such denial. Uh, but if you, if you only live in your online bubble, you might never actually be exposed to that. And so this is one of the big issues that I think we will have to confront within the future in making sure that the truth uh, and, and history as, as it happened uh, does, uh, is something that every citizen is confronted with in some way. And that we identify those who deny and we address that and we somehow also uh, get people to, to be confronted with uh, with um, uh, uh, opposing uh, with different views, uh, I mean, of course, in a in a free society, everyone can believe what they want to believe. Everyone can think what they want to think, but I think it is absolutely crucial that the state does whatever it can to make sure that information gets to its citizens. And again, we are back in education. I think it's crucial, of course, that young people grow up learning what history really was, and I think that is the best foundation for them. To be able to uh, uh, then 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 build their world worldview uh, on the values that I think also your foundation also uh, and and you you yourself uh, continue to to pursue. You know, uh, uh, Holocaust denial is really uh, a, a mission in confronting what can happen to other people in a similar way. Look, Roma also suffered. Or when I addressed uh, 700 uh, relatives in Srebrenica in the year, uh, this is the heart of Europe, 8,000 men and their sons with the UN peacekeepers, uh, Dutch peacekeepers around, uh, murdered. So it's not only a, uh, a remembrance as far as Jewish suffering, but it's also something, a warning. It can happen to any other people. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, I've used Vienna as a place for reconciliation. Uh, during the uh, Yugoslav Civil War, uh, bringing together the religious leaders of uh, both Catholic, Patriarch Pablo, and the Kosovo situation. So I think Austria has a very important role, particularly because of geographic location, to be a bridge builder in terms of stability and peace 
uh, not only for Europe, but for all of humanity. Uh, how do you see Austria's role? Well, thank you very much. It's something that we very much hope to be. And I think it has been ever since the, 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 the end of the Second World War, a role that Austrian foreign policy has actively sought. Um, we, we, of course, during the Cold War, we were almost a natural bridge builder because we were a neutral country in the middle of the, between those two big blocks confronting each other. But even after 1989, we have tried always to be uh, helpful, uh, either through mediation or through acting with uh, good offices uh, for others to meet in Austria. And we are very grateful to you that you brought our religious leaders there, which is a very important compo component. We have always said that it is one thing for politicians to meet, but it is the society itself. If you want this to have a lasting impact, you need uh, the, the, the objectives of politicians and, and their uh, commitments that they might undergo at a political meeting. You need that to have support in the population because otherwise it will become a treaty that does not get implemented. So therefore getting civil society, getting religious communities involved in peace process is, is extremely important. And Vienna has tried to do this in, through a variety of, 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 of many issues. We are very happy that the UN uh, also uh, has offices in Vienna. We are happy that the OSCE has its uh, office in Vienna. All of these institutions are political institutions which bring together uh, uh, um, people from very uh, different nations that uh, that 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 have um, serious conflicts with one another, and use Vienna uh, as a as a place to to uh, to talk, to speak, and I think that uh, what you said about um, it's not, um, this this remembrance and the fact that we that we look back at the the difficult time, the terrible crimes that were committed, is so important. Is that we must use this to avoid new crimes, and I think if. You mentioned that in the in the cathedral in the Stephansdom, uh, all the religious communities got together. Um, if you read uh, Chancellor Kurz's speech that he that he made, it's also available on English. He specifically also called uh, Austrians uh, that this terror act that just happened should not divide the society. That we must stay together. That all the religions have a place, and that even if the perpetrator might have come from the uh, Islamic State. Uh, this should not uh, uh, in any way be used as an excuse to, uh, to now uh, go after the, 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 the Muslim community in Vienna. And I think also the Muslim community has tried in Vienna very much to demonstrate that it is fully uh, 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 behind the government efforts uh, and the other uh, uh, citizens' efforts to make sure that this does not happen again and will work also on the education programs and will assist us also in making sure that something like this hopefully will not happen again. Yes, you find that uh, it, the trend now is finger pointing and uh, blaming. Uh, we have to recognize, it's my own experience during the uh, show up, there is the beast of man and I met the beast of man. A Mengele and Eichmann, a beast of man. And there's so many others. But then there are other hero diplomats, whether it's the Japanese, whether it's the Portuguese, they were determined, even when they sacrificed their own diplomatic career, to save life. So I think that uh, unfortunately we live at a time when there is generalization. And I must say, I was very moved that uh, two Turkish, Austrian young men risking their lives in Vienna during this terrorist attack. Can you elaborate on that one, saving the old woman? Yes, exactly. Uh, they, they, this was during the attack, while the attacker was still shooting. Uh, that uh, two uh, Turkish uh, citizens went uh, and saved, uh, uh, first of all, pulled, uh, from what my understanding is, I, I've also just noted this from the news report, so this, this, is, this comes with a caveat that I, 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 of course, don't know the exact facts. But what I read, that they uh, assisted a policeman that had been shot 
and 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 carried him out of the out of the line of fire, uh, and also uh, helped uh, other citizens uh, escaping from or, or or getting out of the immediate zone where the the the, the terrorist was still shooting. Uh, uh, so you have two heroes in this in this uh, in, in 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 this terrible attack, and of course the fact that they are also. Uh, Muslim, like the attacker, and I said, you must also remember one of the victims, one a, a young man, a 20-year-old man that was shot by this uh, 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 assailant, this terrorist who came from, uh, as we know, who, who, who's an Austrian, who was born in Austria, who went to school in Austria, but who has roots in, in the Albanian uh, uh, northern Macedonia. But one of the victims that was shot was also a 20-year-old uh, a young Albanian Macedonian. So uh, we we can see that this is that there is evil, as you said, and there is good. And I think for me always it has been that if we can do in every situation that we are confronted with, if we have choices to make every day, if we can try ourselves to be, try at least try to do good, that that then maybe we can all together contribute. It's so much easier to point out what others should be doing. I think the for me, it's always been if I just focus on what I could be doing, uh, then that would be already something. At least I would do my piece to to make make to try to make make the whole world better. Which sounds uh, question, easy, I'm aware. Uh, have you seen, because of the uh, diplomatic relation or normalization between Israel and Bahrain, the UAE, and also Sudan, uh, any any shift in terms of mood? Uh, at the UN on uh, a new Middle East development? I, this, this is what we all hope for. Uh, and I think we have, and uh, Minister Schallenberg has made this also very clear, we have really welcomed uh, uh, this development, also Chancellor Kurtz. Uh, these, these new agreements uh, that have been concluded with, uh, between Israel and the states that you mentioned, this is a real positive development and we hope that this will trickle down. I think I, I, it is, I think, still a bit too early uh, um, to see the impact at the UN. I think at the moment what we might be seeing is uh, that um, that there that the the you will not, for example, see presumably a lot of impact in the votes as they go. We just had our, the voting yesterday in the fourth committee on some of the, the the Palestinian package resolutions. Don't don't look for that. I think we will not find that there. This is much too recent. I think the impact we will see will be there and it will depend on these Arab states uh, working within the Arab group because the Arab group also has just like we are the EU group, the European group. Uh, if the Arab group changes some of its, uh, of, of its policies there, I think it's something that we will see uh, quite strongly, but this takes time. But the fact that this happened this year is of course very important uh, and we, this, this may have lasting, lasting impact. We have to, of course, now see also what the reaction is on the Israeli side and what does this mean. Uh, in, in, in many of, the, of these Arab states now also have the hope that this has uh, put uh, annexation off the table. Uh, and I think uh, everyone is now looking at what the other side is doing. Uh, so we are at one of these situations that you know well in international diplomacy. Uh, I think I think if everyone now keeps the the long term goal, which is best relations, peace in the Middle East, if if we sort of keep this goal in mind, I, I think that's something that could have could have been a very important start. Uh, having served as a U.S. alternate representative to the United Nations in 1988, this was still uh, Gorbachev, Reagan, okay. I'm a firm believer that every conflict comes to an end. I remember when uh, Austria was divided, Vienna was divided by the four, okay? You had to go from one zone to the other zone, right? Okay. Exactly. Today, Vienna is one city, right? <laughs> and when you will uh, join us for the International Holocaust Remembrance Shabbat at Parque Synagogue, when I sit on the pulpit with the Secretary General and I see in the first row the Israeli permanent representative, Russia, Germany, <laughs> Japan, 
China. But you think, going back in history, some of these nations were enemies. So I salute you for devoting your life's work to be a peace builder. And that has been uh, your really commitment to your country and also to humanity. Delighted to have you with us. And I hope that uh, we will see healing, not only healing of the uh, pandemic, but also healing in terms of a divided humanity and a divided world, which unfortunately is reflected in the United Nations too. Yes. A divided world with self-interest. So we pray that we will learn from history in united, united, we prevail, divided, we fail. And as I always say, we are in the same boat. We either swim together or sink together. But you're a swimmer. <laughs> I hope so, yes, yes. And with the help of everyone else, we can swim together. Well, I, really, I wish you a, a very successful uh, term in the United Nations. Uh, and. Uh, I uh, also think that uh, grateful for the security and safety of Austrian society. And that means across the board. And that is, we will stand against those who want to disrupt and destroy peaceful coexistence, be it in Austria, be it here in the United States, or anywhere else. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Any, you, any, you. You have the last word. No, nothing. To, nothing to add to that, uh, dear Rabbi Schneier. Just, just to say, you will always have Austria as your closest partner on all these issues. Well, I left Vienna, but my birthplace is still Vienna. <laughs> Vienna is still in my heart. And I hope you will still come and visit often. I do. In fact, you know, my father, fortunately, died before the Kristallnacht. So he was buried in the trial Friedhof, and I visit every year. Unfortunately, my grandfather, who was deported from Vienna to Theresienstadt, and then met his death in Lublin, uh, only a memorial. And that's why I was so, so moved to participate uh, when the chancellor Kurtz, whom I admire greatly, we dedicated a monument to the Holocaust in the heart of the city of Vienna, so the people will remember. Yes, there's the wall of victims with 64,000 names that will be erected, and that these works are continuing even now during the lockdowns that we've had this year. So now, those who were privileged only to live in freedom for listening to our conversation, also get a picture of the change that has occurred. What Vienna under the Nazi regime and a democratic, free Austria, member of the European Union, and a government that seeks to protect and save. Thank God we live to see it. I say thank God I live to see it. So, from darkness to light. <laughs> Beautiful. God bless you. Thank you so much, Irish Nair. All the best to you, and thank you for all your wonderful work that you are doing.